Sure. Oh, hi guys, um, today we're with uh, Professor Shake, and um, I'm sure everyone already read her Wikipedia page, so I'm gonna go straight into the questions. <laughs> um, so uh, my first question would be, um, uh, what do you think are the three main concepts of your book? Because uh, your book goes through quite a few different concepts, including um, the, uh, um, what was it? Um, oops, <laughs> sorry, I'm a bit nervous. Um, uh, including Fukuyama's theory and uh, including um, other uh, economic arguments um, from, um, from the passage. So um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll pass the microphone to you. Okay. Uh, so the three I would pick, I would start uh, not with Fukuyama, but with Hegel, who underlies Fukuyama. Uh, and the notion we are getting a great real-time historical test of Hegel's proposition that as people become more prosperous, they become more demanding political consumers. Uh, and that has proven true, uh, right? The country's most sustainably prosperous countries are free societies. And mm -hmm. I think there's reason to believe it is true uh, because as our economies move up the value chain of production, they become a lot more reliant on creativity and, and voluntary activity. And those tend to prosper in free societies where people can choose the kind of work they do and are motivated by a wide diversity of reasons. Um, but China has for 40 years become, been becoming more prosperous without becoming more politically uh, liberal or inclusive. And so uh, that's one idea, I think, from the book, that we should all be looking for signs to see whether Hegel continues to be right. The second idea from the book is about what makes for a peaceful transition between a rising challenger to the existing international order and the uh, country or group of countries that uh, are real givers and enforcers in the system. Uh, and my book looks at one particular case study, which is the only transition that occurs peacefully among hegemons. And that is the late 19th century rise of the United States to supplant Britain. Um, and my explanation for why it happens peacefully is a highly contingent historical outcome whereby the United States, because of its westward expansion, comes to think of itself in imperial terms and Britain democratizes. And so those two countries look similar to each other and different from everybody else. And that makes possible a sense of collective power uh, between those two uh, powerful countries that hadn't occurred before among other hegemons. And it dissipates pretty quickly uh, because the United States is successful in reshaping the international order as a macrocosm of its domestic political order, namely inclusive with a transparent set of rules that more or less apply to everybody um, and that make this international order um, more advantageous to middle and small powers than prior international hegemonic arrays of power have been. And therefore it is, and this is the third point, uh, much more self-sustaining than other international orders have been because we're not the only people holding it up. It's in the interest of the Netherlands and Australia and other countries that would see any different kind of international order as less advantageous for them. So when Americans ask, why don't allies do more for their own defense? That's a totally legitimate question. 
um, to which there are a complicated series of answers, but the main one is, it's the wrong question for the hegemon to ask. The question for the hegemon to ask is, has any other dominant power ever had this much voluntary assistance by others in maintaining the international order? And the answer to that is decisively no. Um, my second question, because we're very, we're all really hawks. We're very I'm hawks. sorry, sorry if you said just the wrong answer to the question. No. I apologize. Was, it was a wonderful answer. It's, it's also why your book's so wonderful, because uh, your book has so many hidden arguments behind the, the, the facade of a, uh, well, I'm not sure if I should say facade, the main argument. Um, so hey, I, I, thank you for that. What a nice compliment. Um, uh, our second question comes from uh, a student in the Italian Military Academy. And uh, he, he asks you why, because um, in your book you talk about the, the possibility of a British uh, intervention in the Civil War or uh, the British supporting the Confederates. And um, he was wondering why uh, we, as the United States, didn't um, intervene in China during the 50s. Um, <laughs> it's a bit of a far-fetched question. but Yeah, uh, that, no, it's a fabulous cool. question and a great parallel, a great use of what he read in the book to parallel to a question he's interested in. Uh, I, th so, I would, I would say a couple of things. The first is, I think it's impossible to understand the culture of the United States in the 1950s with its almost willful innocence, right? Like, um, it's impossible to understand that without, outside of the context of the fact that uh, it comes after 10 million young Americans had had to fight Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, um, and Imperial Japan, right? What they wanted for themselves, these young men whose lives had been so disrupted, and uh, the women who, you know, 8 million women went to work outside their homes in the United States for the first time during World War II. And the 1950s, I think, are best understood as those people wanting boring normalcy, right? The, the men wanted jobs as insurance adjusters. Can you imagine a more boring, right? Like they didn't, they'd had a life's worth of terror and excitement. They didn't want to go to horror movies. Um, they wanted to be able to have stay-at-home moms and boring jobs and uh, two martini lunches. And so I think the 1950s are a period where the United States sees the international order changing and chooses not to use military force to change it for the most part. Um, Moreover, a second factor that I think weighs importantly in the decisions about China in the 1950s is that this is the period of decolonization where great empire, Britain, France, Germany are being forced by both their uh, philosophy of governance and their receding international power to allow colonial possessions to become actual self-governed societies. And that caused an enormous amount of friction between the United States and its European allies, because for example, Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill have a deep break over Indian independence. I think I write in the book that at the Tehran conference, FDR was talking with Stalin about how the Soviet model might be a good one for India after independence. Uh, so the United States really wanted to be on the side of emergent representative government governments. Um, and it wasn't so clear in the early 1950s which side of China's um, civil war uh, better represented that. And I think the third uh, reason would be that China in the 1950s 
uh, didn't feel like a major power to the United States. And most of the bandwidth was taken up by trying to help uh, non-communist forces win elections in Italy and forcing Europeans to accept German rearmament and getting the European coal and steel community functional so that the area of our major economic interest and our major sentimental and philosophical connections uh, got stabilized in the aftermath of you know, two terrible wars in people's living memory. The next question would be uh, my question. So it, it would be, um, do you still think the middle income trap is going to um, make the, the US the eventual winner of this 100 year, year battle? Um. So I love that question. I'm going to push back on the premise of the 100 year battle because I think we shouldn't buy into this propaganda that the Chinese system produces brilliant strategists that free societies are incapable of, and that you know they've got a generation, a century long perspective, but us crummy democratic countries can't build high speed train tracks. Um, and uh, it's true that it's harder to get governmental things done in free societies. But the reason is because we respect people's human rights, people's property rights, um, and the need to build consensus around action. And the political science literature is actually very clear that uh, the building of consensus makes outcomes much more durable, uh, both domestically and internationally. So I don't buy the fact that it's a hundred year contest and the Chinese are brilliant strategists that we free people are incapable of. But uh, to your actual question, uh, which is navigating the middle income trap, I actually think the Chinese are failing at it. I would commend to you the work of Michael Beckley, who's a professor at Tufts, um, and a fellow in my team at the American Enterprise Institute. He does a lot of work on the small bore economic inputs to uh, productiv productivity growth and GDP growth. And his work shows pretty conclusively that China has probably already passed the zenith of its economic power and that the cost to China of producing additional GDP growth is actually already more expensive than the cost to produce additional GDP growth in the United States. Um, and um, it's, it's a pretty persuasive economic case. And it is also uh, provides a useful explanation for why China has become so much more domestically repressive and internationally aggressive in the last few years. Because if we can figure out from Chinese sources uh, the cost of additional GDP growth, I think the self-interested Chinese government can also figure that out. And it suggests to me that they may be trying before their power um, stalls to reset rules of international order and China's position in it. Um, so I think we don't have a China 2200 or 2150 problem. We may have a China 2025 problem, um, and uh, which is, you know, worrisome in different ways but not necessarily less worrisome. The middle income uh, trap is really sorry, hard uh, to navigate. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Uh, could you please repeat the, uh, um, uh, the author and the research that you mentioned relative to the um, economic statistics? Sure, Luca. His name's Michael Beckley, B-E-C-K-L-E-Y. Mm -hmm. He teaches at Tufts and actually the best um, short encapsulation of his work 
-hmm. is crazily enough in the journal of certified accountants or something like that. Like he wrote for an accounting journal because he wanted the validation of those nerds thinking he had done the right, um, he had the right indicators. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I believe we interrupted you. You're about to talk about the middle yes. income yeah. trap. Yeah, I think the middle income trap is frequently underestimated. And probably the best example is remember when Goldman Sachs said the global economy was going to be overtaken by the BRICS, right? Brazil, Russia, India, and China. And now it's just China 10 years later. And I think the answer is because navigating through the middle income trap, getting from an economy that is either extracting resources from its natural deposits or cheaply producing low-end manufacturers. Like countries that find a way to do that get growth spurts. But there are two problems um, getting past that. And the first is um, that uh, producing globally competitive high-end manufacturers or shifting your economy to a service industry. Those things tend to require the rule of law, um, good governance, uh, entrepreneurs who can see global market niches, a regulatory framework that supports business and innovation. And those things all tend to be associated with good governance. That's why Brazil is a disaster. That's why India struggles. That's why China has probably already surpassed its peak performance. And that's why Russia continues to be an economy that's little more than a gas station, right? Talented Russians, they live in, uh, they live in Los Angeles. Um, and so keeping your country's most talented people actually requires a complicated set of civil society and governance and infrastructure. I mean, uh, more than a third of China's millionaires have already applied to immigrate. Um, and, and you know where the countries they're applying to immigrate to are? The top two are the US and Canada. Um, and, and so, and, and if you interrogate the why, as several NGOs have done, the answer is they want clean air, they want good schools, um, and they want a country where their kids can grow up and be president. And those are very difficult things for emerging economies to replicate. And we very often underestimate the extent to which free societies have enormous advantages. And that's the reason their economies sit at the top of the value chain. Our next question is from a friend of ours who works in an accounting firm. Yay. <laughs> um, um, well, she asks us, uh, well, she asks you, um, well, oh, let me see the question again. Sorry about that. Um, um, uh, what's the economic perspective of um, the passage of uh, world domination? As in, um, uh, uh, the British economy was much weaker after the Second World War and was much, much weaker. And we, we were just wondering if you could have a, another economic perspective. Oh, I'd be so happy to. Uh, I should, however, offer the disclaimer that I'm not an economist. So those of you who are accountants need to keep me honest and let me know if I'm talking nonsense. Um, what I know from the history is that, um, that if you look sheer at sheer economic figures, 
the American economy surpasses the British economy and becomes the globally uh, most valuable one in the late 1870s. So it's not a post-World War II phenomenon. Uh, what happens with the end of the American Civil War is that all of the engineering breakthroughs that, that the war incentivized, um, you know, the transition from sail to steam, iron-sided ships instead, the expansion of railroads, Right, you don't get the continental United States connected by rail until the late 1870s. But once you do, it really opens up the productivity of farming land and the Great Plains, the uh, transit of cattle from south to north, the enormous repositioning of capital as more productive northern industries buy up southern plantations. Um, and it, it's crass to say it, but it's also true that uh, bondage slavery is a very inefficient economic system. Actually, for reasons we were talking about, about the middle income trap, because the motivation of landowners to produce um, on their for their own good, rather than people being compelled in slavery, uh, also produces a lot better outcomes economically in the American South. And you get this huge amount of international investment because of the big engineering projects like the Transcontinental Railroad and the beginning of damming of rivers in the West. Um, so, uh, so the actual economic supplanting, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, and one other economic factor, which is the discovery of gold in California in 1848 and silver in Nevada in the 1860s and gold in the Dakota territories in the 1870s are, are just a huge bonanza for the United States economically. Um, and that's what pushes the American economy into the position of global dominance. But the question is also a good one because it's not immediately apparent, right? There aren't a lot of good accountants keeping track of the economic statistics actually until after World War I and the United States government's own assessments um, of the economies in particular of Europe, the United States became the banker in particular to Britain during World War I, but anticipated that what happened after World War II, which is the free societies quickly becoming economically dynamic again, the US government thought would happen after World War I, and it doesn't. You don't have enough global connectedness. You don't have enough, you don't have the splurge of capital that the Marshall Plan brings after World War II to help economies like Italy reconstruct their transit network um, and things like that. Um, so, so it doesn't happen after World War I. And of course, the punitive nature of the Versailles settlement, um, not principally on Germany, but not just on Germany after World War I, is also a huge inhibition, not only to Germany's economy, but to the economies that trade with it. I've got one really fast last question, if it's not a problem. Okay. Because um, I know you're, you're, you're pressed for time. Um, well, our, our last question. No, I'm in the middle of performance evaluations of the 47 people who work for me. So this oh, is such oh. a welcome substantive <laughs> interregnum. Um, so the very quick question would be, um, our last uh, guest, uh, the author of Tomorrow the World, um, advocates for a very small military presence in the world. So he doesn't advocate for 11 aircraft carriers and 20 
um, support crafts. And um, I was just wondering, what do you think are the, the advantages of having world domination, or three advantages of having world domination, or the Pax Americana? So there's a reason that the people who built the current international order of uh, mutually agreed rules situated in institutions and reinforced by the collective power of free societies built that system, right? This wasn't a, a liberal sitting around the faculty lounge coming up with the ideal world order. These were the men who had fought World War I and World War II, right? Two society crushing conflicts in the space of a human lifetime. And what they wanted was to create an international order that had greater stability and a wider margin of error where you addressed threats as they were developing rather than before they reached the magnitude of a gathering storm. And they originally tried to do it just with international institutions, right? Creating the United Nations um, and a NATO alliance that had no military structure, just a vague commitment uh, that we would consult with one another if somebody got attacked. Um, and then the, the North Korean invasion of South Korea happened and it scared the hell out of those architects of the international order that this wasn't stabilizing enough. I'm sorry, I left out the economic piece of it, right? That they saw in 1947 and 1948, the trend towards a resurgence of authoritarianism and anti-democratic activity in Germany, in Italy, in Denmark, um, because the economic strain of societies that had been crushed by the conflict was scaring people. And when people are scared, they don't make brave choices, right? That's true personally, it's true internationally. Um, and so, the great economic recovery program uh, was a way to build greater political stability into the international order. And then the Korean, the invasion of South Korea happens um, and the free societies again become fearful that we don't have enough stability built into the system and we need to actually have com commitments to common protection that are credible, not just to each other, but to the potential aggressors in the system. And uh, because American power was so um, overwhelming compared to others at the time, because our society had not been destroyed by the war, that in fact, the industrial capacity of the United States that was harnessed, um, right? Like the joke is what is everybody want in World War II. Um, they want uniforms like the Soviets have and they want food like the Americans have, right? So it harnesses the productive capacity of the United States. We were 50% of global GDP in 1945. Um, and we had a military that not only could shift the balance in Europe, it could swing to the Pacific and destroy Imperial Japan. Um, and so the United States was the natural guarantor of the security order. And Eisenhower would be shocked to know that the United States still had troops stationed in Europe because, you know, when he testified to Congress in favor of it in 1950, he argued that it was just until France and Germany could restore their natural strength and that that would be enough. But that was before we saw the magnitude of the threat and the enduring hold the Soviet Union would have on what used to be known as Eastern Europe and what is now known as NATO. Um, because 
what the security order that the United States underwrites does is create stability that makes possible the economic vibrancy and political stability. And that we achieve that at actually very low cost compared to the anxiety of instability in the system or compared to having to restore order once a, a state, a society of people we actually like and want to be successful get attacked. And on that note, my friends, I have to go back to doing uh, my personnel reviews for my terrific AEI team. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to have this conversation with you. I've enjoyed it thank enormously. You so much. And a huge thank you to Dr. Nakazoni, who helped us organize the, the, the meet. Thank you so much. I call her frequently fired Sarah. Whenever oh. I don't like something, I fire Sarah, but unfortunately I'm utterly dependent on her. So yeah. she just shrugs off being fired and does her day job again. Madonna, it was a great pleasure Thanks. to be in your company. Thank you, my friends. Bye. Thank you.